Well, all things must come to an end eventually, and the Dallas Mavericks five-game win streak was decidedly put to an end tonight against the Clippers. This was a good measuring stick. I know we've had a lot of those so far this year. We thought early on in the year Portland was good, like a good measuring stick. And based on the Portland identity they still had before they had just completely fallen off, not completely, but largely fallen off this year as they have, that that was true. Pelicans was a good, tough, gritty nose uh, road win. Nose win? Road win. Boston was another tough environment. Fell away late in that one, but largely stayed right there in the thick of it throughout the game. This was the first time the Mavericks went up against an absolute elite team. Now, you might be saying, well, what about the Lakers? I still think the Lakers are a very good team, and I could see them coming out of the West potentially. But compared to what I saw tonight with the Clippers, that's it. The Clippers are the cream of the crop in the Western Conference. The Lakers, they're good. Yeah, their two best players are, you'd be hard-pressed to beat them. If they're healthy, that one-two punch is probably unmatched. However, the Clippers have a lot more depth, a lot more lockdown defenders, and yeah, I'm just going to say it, they're a better team. Kawhi and Paul George, they're definitely the next step you would take. If you can't have LeBron Anthony Davis... Uh, you're going to throw in Kawhi and Paul George as your, what's the word you're looking for there, a consolation prize. So yes, the Clippers are damn good. Now, they haven't started off this year great. They were 1-4 and four on the road entering tonight in Dallas. But that's a little misleading because Paul George didn't play a lot at the very start of the year, missed the first few games of the year. And then they've been resting, doing... Uh, load management for Kawhi Leonard and for Paul George been kind of alternating them you haven't really had a lot of games with both guys playing and because of the Mavericks hot streak they took that seriously they played two nights ago and they rolled back out for this game in Dallas so enormous respect from the Clippers even just in subtle gestures like that but there's also several quotes you can look at as well where they were previewing this matchup and yeah they see it they get what is so special about Luka and why Dallas has been a surprise team thus far in the Western Conference. And, you know, this is this is a game where you, you got their best shot, I really feel. You got the Clippers' best shot. Whereas for Dallas, I felt like it was largely an off night. Uh, I, I think, I'm not going to say they weren't focused for this game because I don't think that was the case at all. But I think that on the back of this streak where Luka's been playing just balls out, uh, efficiency rating and all that higher per than the record held by Wilt Chamberlain thus far on the year. I mean, he's been phenomenal. But even though he's been crazy uh, efficient in in this short year, and he's not playing huge minutes, he's still playing 34, 35 minutes a game, and he's still putting in a ton of work. Almost every possession is running through him, and he's just making things happen. I felt like he looked a little tired tonight. You add to that the fact that, as I mentioned, the Clippers have phenomenal lockdown defenders and Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard is a two-time defensive player of the year. Paul George, uh, he's an NBA, all-NBA defensive team player. He's a guy who has been a lockdown defender for much of his career. And then, oh yeah, you got Patrick Beverly, who wasn't really a factor in this game because, hey, one of the few things Dallas was able to do right tonight was keep that guy in constant foul trouble. He is an irritant, and that's what he's always been. It's kind of why I wanted him in Dallas, because when he's on your side, you just like the dog in him. But when he's against you, you're like wanting to tear your hair out. Like, this guy is such a dirty player, and he's such a just jackass. It's so infuriating to deal with him. But Dallas didn't have it in this game, man. The only thing even keeping them relatively in it for a while was the fact that they were getting to the foul line. Uh, you know, the the Clippers, they they are in every sense a legitimate team, like a legitimate complete team. Lou Williams cooking off the bench, 21 points for him off the bench. 21-6-6 six six on 50% shooting, 4-7 of seven from 3 for him. Montrez Harrell didn't have a huge game, but he's a big part of what they do as well. Green played some quality minutes. Uh, what I was really interested in was Harkless. I thought he had a, a quiet impact in this game as well. Just defensively, you kind of saw how he was creating 
difficult situations as well. So it's not even like they have to just exclusively throw, oh, you have to throw Paul George or Kawhi exclusively at Luka. No, you can throw these other guys too. You can throw Green at them every now and then. You could throw Harkless at them, and you're still going to get irritant, pesky, tough-nosed defense. And that doesn't even include Patrick Beverly. I mean, the Clippers can switch everything defensively and still have the length, speed, and athleticism to make up for it and contest a shot even when you do move the ball well. And the difference in this game, this was a matchup of two of the premier benches in the league, and the Mavericks bench had the highest plus-minus in the NBA coming into this game. Not anymore, they don't. And in the battle of the benches, the Clippers decidedly won in this game, and it, it really never was close. Paul George was cooking in the first quarter, set the tone with 17 of his 26 points in the first quarter. Shooting percentage-wise, he didn't have a great night, but he did have six steals, which was crazy. Uh, four boards, two assists as well in just 29 minutes. So, like I said, his first quarter really set the tone. He had four threes in that first quarter. And Kawhi, you know, he got he got going more in the second half, but 28 points, 28 minutes, eight boards, four assists on 11 of 21 for him. Beverly played 21 minutes, but was hardly a presence. And uh, I already mentioned Harold and Williams. So for Dallas, uh, Luca, Luca ended with 22, 8, and 6. But you know what? It was not a good night for Luca. Eight boards, cool. That's you know about on par. A little, a little under his average. Six assists, four of 14 shooting, zero for eight from beyond the arc. The only thing that made it work for him in this game was getting to the line. Made his first, I think, 11 free throws. Ended up 14 of 16 for the game. He did have uh, three steals, but he also committed seven turnovers. And, yeah, minus seven for the game for him. So, not a good game for him at all in that regard. Not up to the standard that we've seen. But, like I said, you're going to have games like that when it's not cooking for you. And that's that's understandable. That's natural. At the same time, this is where when you are having to put everything into one guy and run everything through him, it's why it can't work in the big picture in the long term. We've seen like guys put up these historic seasons with these crazy usage rates, right? Uh, James Harden, Russell Westbrook, LeBron uh, back when he was in Cleveland the first time. We've seen that kind of production, and you can put up historic numbers, and you can do all of that. That's great. The next step is to build the team around him to not have to rely so much on just that one guy. But that's what Dallas is going to have to do. As I've said before, I'm not moving the goalpost. I still think this is a playoff team for Dallas, but I'm not moving the goalpost and shifting my expectations to suddenly act like, oh my heavens, this this is a disgrace. This team should be playing them on equal footing. No, the Clippers are the cream of the crop in terms of talent, in terms of depth, and defensive presence, everything I said. The Mavericks are a team who, for this first year, yeah, their offense has been insane thanks to their hot past week. The the team as a whole, not just Luka, was cooking the last three or four games in particular, and that elevated the whole thing. That's why we were through 16 games, and the Mavericks were averaging historic levels of offensive efficiency at over 117 points per 100 possessions for context in that case the kd steph warriors and all that i think set the record at 115 per 100 possessions granted of course that's a whole season compared to as i just said 16 games for the mavericks but that was what people were looking at like this mavericks team in the past week had some echoes of that 2014 15 club where you had Monte Ellis, yes, I'm going to say it, Chandler Parsons, Tyson, Dirk, and you just had a lot working on that team. The one thing you didn't have was a point guard. You were running Jameer Nelson, and you still had a historically good offense before blowing it up essentially in the Rajon Rondo trade, which destroyed the season and the next couple years essentially for the Mavericks. But Speaking of the Rondo trade, the one asset you still have left from that deal, Dwight Powell did not have a good night. Dwight Powell, Dwight Powell's not having a good season, man. Like, I've tried to be patient with it, and obviously it's not like my opinion on this really matters, but he's having a bad year. So maybe 
Maybe just like how we kind of were on Tim Hardaway's case for a while and he woke up and played for a few games really, really well. Maybe that can happen for Dwight because Dwight had several bad hands plays, uh, plays where he got a, he received a good pass. It hits him right in the hands and he just loses control of it, fumbles it away. And then if he does recover it, he's turning it over immediately on a bad pass right to the defenders. And it's just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? That should have been a that should have been a dunk. You know, that should have been an alley oop dunk. And instead, you fumble it, awkwardly turn around, and then just whip it right to the defense. Cool. And then yeah, he gets going a little bit late. He gets a couple and ones, a couple drives to the basket basket. He ends up four or five on the game, but it's like, dude, this is garbage time. There, there's nothing left. You know what I mean? Like this isn't the same environment or situation. Where was this the whole game from you? That's been kind of the year it feels like for Dwight. He's not he's not stopping. I mean, he ends up a zero, not a plus or a minus on the game, but a flat zero. 24 minutes, 10 points. I'm 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 frustrated with Powell. I I think what you saw last year when he started to emerge later in the year, you saw it happening as the team was tanking. Suddenly his numbers were 15 and 7 and we were like, "Oh ho, here you go." This on a serviceable contract doesn't sound so bad. And I don't know. I understand the continuity we were trying to do, and I'm not writing him off at all. But he's having a miserable start to the year, and this was a game where he just got abused. And, you know, I get it. Maxi played 18 minutes, comparatively speaking. And Maxi's been very good this year. He wasn't anything special in this game. In fact, uh, Maxi had himself, if you're looking at just the pure plus minus, Maxi had himself a miserable game. 18 minutes and a minus 19, 0. 0.6 boards. He had been shooting like 35, 36% from three this year. Doesn't connect on either of his attempts there, but you know what? Not the end of the world. That's just an accent to his game that you like to see. But the Mavericks as a team didn't shoot the ball well in this game. In the first half, they were shooting like 31%. I mean, it was abysmal, and they were turning the ball over. Yeah, most turnovers of the year, I believe, for the Mavericks in this game with 20. 20. They had 13 at half. Like, way, way sloppy with the ball. The Clippers were playing with more energy. They were playing more physically. They were, um, you know, they, they were just making all those little in-between plays and everything like that. The Mavericks think they secure a rebound, and as they're bringing it down to try, like, more or less handing it off to... Uh, whether it was Luca or whoever was running the offense at that point, you'd see, uh, you'd see one of the Clippers players. I, I, the guy I noticed doing it a lot was Montrez Harrell. Uh, get a hand in there and just knock the ball away, and suddenly it's off like Luca's fingertips and out of bounds or something. And it's like, oh, turnover! You just had a secured possession, and now you give it back to them right underneath their basket. Plays like that, you just saw stuff like that happening, and it was just like, oh, guys, come on, you got you have to tighten things up. And they just weren't able to do that. They shoot 38%. I mean, field goal percentage ended up balancing out fairly well. 38% for the Mavericks compared to 42% for the Clippers. Three-point percentage, 29% compared to 33 The Clippers were cooking from beyond the arc in the first half. It ended up you know, kind of dropping back to the median. And it just opened things up a little bit for Dallas. But they just couldn't get stops. The interior defense went to hell. And the Clippers were just able to do anything. They took, even when KP got going a little bit there in the third quarter, and you're like, okay, there's three or four baskets straight from KP. All right, all right, here we go. Keep getting to the line. Keep getting, okay, Clippers score. All right. All right, well, hey, hey, KP again. Oh, no, Clippers score. Mm. Okay, to the foul line. Uh, okay, missed one of two. Oh, look, Clippers scored. Like, it didn't matter. No matter what the Mavericks did, they couldn't get the stops. And that led to the Clippers continually continually either weathering the storm or pushing the lead back out further. Free throws, that was an area the Mavericks excelled in this game. It's what kept a minute, 28 of 35 at the line for 80%. The Clippers end up shooting 30 as well, 21 of 30. A lot of those came in the second half, however. I already mentioned the 20 turnovers for Dallas. Out-assisted as well, 22 to 16. Out-rebounded by 10 Clippers got 17 offensive rebounds. The Clippers, I think they said in the broadcast, are the highest offensive rebounding rate team in the in, a, in the NBA. I almost said NFL. Suddenly was thinking Cowboys Thanksgiving game or something for a second. In the NBA, the highest offensive rebound rate. 
uh, in the league. I think they said it like 30%, which is crazy if that's the case. But uh, Mavericks get nine offensive boards, out blocked three to two. Clippers did commit more fouls, and that that pretty much is the quick summary of it. I mean, the Mavericks just in this game, they did not have it working for them. Other standouts for the Mavericks, uh, I mentioned KP earlier, 30 minutes, 15 points, 10 boards. He's still rebounding well, but the offense isn't there. Yeah, he hits the crazy basically half-court spot-up three at the end of the first half to give Dallas at least a little a little gasp of life, but it, it's just not enough. He hits a couple shots as well in the third quarter, but if KP is putting the ball on the deck right now, it, it's just a certain disaster play. He's getting stripped every time or he's not getting the foul or he's, you know, flipping the ball up in, you know, full speed at the rim as he's running at it and he's just missing. He's not executing. He's not completing the play. And that's something that maybe that'll keep coming back with him to him with time. I know his free throw shooting is dropping off. He was 72% on the season entering this game. And uh, at the line in this game, he goes four of eight. He was two of six at one point too. So it, it's going to dip again, and that's not indicative of the kind of free throw shooting you've seen throughout his career. So I'm hopeful that whatever's going on there can start to sort itself out as we get closer into the year. Really for KP, when I want to start seeing like major turning of the corner and flares offensively of the player we saw before, I want to see that around Christmas and the New Year's. If we're, if we're starting to see more of that form coming around then, then I think that'll be on par with what my expectations were at the start of the year when I said, hey, understand it's going to take a little time to knock the rust off to get his you know, feet under him and everything, and uh, just don't overreact to small sample sizes because it, it takes time. He missed 20 months. So I, I think that would be when I would say I'd like to start seeing a little something more, Christmas to New Year, somewhere in that span. I want to start really seeing flashes offensively of that player that he was. And we've seen a couple of them already. Obviously, the Portland game comes to mind, but I'll, you want to see more of it. So him, 30 minutes, 15 points, 10 boards, 4 of 13 from the field, 3 of 8 from 3. Again, uh, 4 of 8 at the line. That's not good enough. One block, two steals. Uh Speaking of which, another former Nick here, Tim Hardaway Jr., his red-hot streak came crashing down. 29 minutes, 8 points, 1 rebound, 1 board, 3 of 8 from the field, 1 of 4 from 3. Um, he did get 3 steals, including a rip of Paul George. That was nice, but the Mavericks turned it over on the other side with, with Luka being called, justly so, by the way, for an offensive foul for hooking the defender as he was driving past him. It was the correct call. I understand Luca's frustration, but dude, <laughs> you're caught red-handed on a blatant hook. You're going to get called for that. Other standouts for the Mavericks. Uh, I say that term loosely. I already mentioned Powell. Seth Curry, 13 points. I should have probably put him on the board um, behind me, but I didn't. Uh, Seth Curry, 19 minutes, 13 points, three of five on threes. A little better for him, you know, a little bit working his way back in. He obviously played better than Hardaway did in that regard, but I think Hardaway brings a little more defensively than Seth does, uh, at least in this game he did. So who knows? Berea, the spark plug, 16 minutes. I, I had there 13 minutes. That's because I started filling this out when there was still a couple minutes left in the game, so it stretched out a little more for him. 12 points, two boards. Is that what his final was? Yeah, 12 points, two boards, 5 of 11 from the field, and uh, 2 of 3 on threes in 16 minutes, not 13 like I have on the board. The Mavericks, uh, like I said, you're going to have this happen every now and then. This is the first time all year that they have been thoroughly, thoroughly handled. And I'm not going to make this game, it still counts as one loss, I'm not going to make out uh, more of it than it is because it, it doesn't seem necessary to do that. It's... It's a one-off game. If, if you have a trend like this where the whole team looks like it's moving through mud or quicksand or whatever the next few games and you struggle against Phoenix and then you struggle against the Lakers in that rematch, uh, if, it, if it starts stretching out at that point, then maybe you look at it and you kind of start to think like, all right, what's going on? Like something, something more maybe. Something's off with the flow of things. It's like they reached a red-hot status and then crashed and burned 
and it takes a while to build back up from that. That's not how it should work. It should be at least a somewhat steady decline back to the median, so to speak. And the median was what we saw in the other 10 games probably on the year, more so than the last five games, although they do have that potential they can play up to. So don't get it twisted and think that I'm suddenly saying because they lost a game, like, oh, they're not that good of a team. No, the Mavericks are a very good team, I think. I just think the Clippers are a great team. In fact, I think they might be the best team in the league when not not just looking at other things, like I said, one of four before tonight on the road, but when you look at all the circumstances and all that, they're not really that occupied with the idea of the number one seed right now, it doesn't look like, whereas LeBron and the Lakers are running out there, kind of making a showmanship of the whole thing. I don't see that from the Clippers. I think the Clippers are kind of going about business a little more quietly, and they're just like, hey, doesn't matter, because I know once we get to a playoff series, it's not going to matter. If we face the Lakers in the playoffs, we're literally playing in the same damn building. It's just what color we paint the court. So, yeah. Um, Mavericks are good. Don't get too discouraged. Understand that this next game is not going to be an easy game either because Phoenix is much better than they were or have been really the past few years. I want to see what their exact record is, actually. I know they've been substantially better. Overall, let me see here. Standings. The Suns are eight and eight on the year. So not not an amazing year. It's not like they're eleven and three or anything crazy like that. But at the same time, I know that doesn't even add up to sixteen games. Sue me. <laughs> but uh they're much better than they have been in the past. And hey, they swept Dallas last year, if I'm not mistaken. So gonna have to figure that one out, but I'm not going to rattle on too much longer. That That's pretty much the gist of it. I don't think I had any, you know, substantive uh, stats or comments or anything that I wanted to go through that I haven't already said. All I can really tell you about this game is it was the first serious, serious measuring stick for the Mavericks. And yeah, they they basically were handled and that's going to happen this is the first year of Luka and KP together I don't think the Mavericks I'm starting to wonder now how much the Mavericks are going to tinker with the the composition of the roster because as I mentioned earlier the last time they had a great great offense they kind of torpedoed the whole thing by making the Rondo trade and so I wonder if they're going to run out this year you know, they, I'm not saying they won't make a trade, but I don't think they're necessarily going to, going to look for that earth-shattering trade that just rearranges the landscape of the Western Conference by any means. Um, no blockbusters, basically, is what I'm saying. I think that they're going to probably run this team through the year, get a year of Luka and KP playing together, see what they look like, see how this team competes in the playoffs, and then from there say, okay, we got to the postseason. Here's what we know. We need to improve here, here, and here. We need an improvement at this position. We need to find another guy who can fill this role off the bench, etc. So I think that's probably, I don't know, that's the feeling I'm getting right now for where this team might be headed. Um, Because nights like this, you know, just like the Mavericks did with James Harden and in the Houston game, they took the ball out of his hands. They made him work really, really hard for everything he got in that game. And he had a fantastic game. I think it was 32 points and uh, one one assist shy of a triple-double, I want to say. Or was it one rebound? Regardless, pretty much a triple-double in that game for him. And the Clippers kind of tried to do that to Luka a little bit in this game as well. Now, he could still get to the rim at will, hence shooting 16 free throws. But they really made him work way, way, so, way more hard than he's had to work in a lot of these other games. And, yeah, you saw the result. Even though the ball had to leave his hands, you had to rely on your bench, which wasn't there. You had to rely on spot-up three-point shooting from guys like Dorian Finney-Smith and Tim Hardaway Jr. and Seth Curry, uh, even DeLon Wright to a little bit of an extent. Maxie had a couple op- opportunities in that regard, and it just didn't hit for Dallas. So this is why I still maintain they need that th- true third man. You're not going to find a Lou-, a Lou Williams out there, but you need to find something, someone who can help elevate this team because it's not there yet. It's very nice. It's very exciting compared to where we've been. And it can be a playoff team and even a team that gets past the first round. But you need one or two more parts, proper parts, mind you, 
to really throw your your hat in the ring for a true contendership. So I'm not going to rattle on any longer, guys. Thank you for watching. Until next time, remember, oh, wait, before I hit the tagline, don't forget to like this video, share, subscribe, all that. And if you really want to support us, you can uh, become a patron on Patreon for us. Pledge of uh, pledge on Patreon to us. And uh, don't forget to buy the shirts at represent.com. Until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.